Hi everybody, thank you for tuning in. This is the volunteer training for paralegal volunteers at um, the Washington New American Citizenship Days. Thank you all for being here and, and for viewing this recording. Here are the things that we're going to go over during this training. We're going to cover the benefits to um, U.S. citizenship and also the barriers that keep people from applying. We'll do a really quick overview of the legal requirements for applying for U.S. citizenship. We'll go pretty in-depth into how to actually complete the N-400 application for citizenship, how to complete the I-912, which is the fee waiver request form, and then a little bit about the citizenship day flow system, logistics, and expectations and requirements for volunteers. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. If you're viewing this remotely, uh, do keep the attachments open so you can refer to them as we proceed through the presentation. You'll want to have the 2015 CD screening and intake form open. When we talk about the N-400, we'll go page by page, so do have that PDF open too. Same with the I-912. And the audio portion does not apply to this recording. So what is Citizenship Day? Citizenship Day is a one-day free legal clinic to help eligible legal permanent residents apply for citizenship all over Washington. We do about 13 clinics a year, and two of those are our big Citizenship Days. Citizenship Days were actually founded by the American Immigration Lawyers Association of Washington um, 11 years ago in 2004, and are now run in partnership with One America. And this program is really one of the only free citizenship services um, still available. And since 2008, we have enabled more than 4,000 people to fill out naturalization applications at one of these events. Some of the benefits of becoming a full U.S. citizen as opposed to just a lawful permanent resident are um, you're finally able to vote. You can access certain um, federal and other government jobs for which citizenship is a requirement. Um, you can run for public office. You can take advantage of uh, federal loans to pursue higher education, um, other scholarships that are available only to U.S. citizens. The peace of mind and, and freedom from deportation. U.S. citizens cannot be deported, but legal permanent residents can. It's quite a bit easier to travel on a U.S. passport. Um, simply having a green card does not guarantee one re-entry into the U.S. after a trip abroad. Um, and then finally, one of the main um, one of the main benefits that clients cite as their reasons for applying are to help certain family members who are back in their home countries, uh, parents, spouses, children, brothers and sisters, sponsor them to immigrate to the U.S. And then uh, citizens who have children under 18 can automatically give citizenship to their children once they naturalize. However, there are quite a few barriers to applying for citizenship. Um, Estimates show that about 180,000 people in Washington are green card holders and are eligible to apply for citizenship, but less than 10% of them have applied. And one of the principal barriers is cost. Um, just filing the form is $680, and then typically if one has to retain a lawyer, and that's advisable for most people, uh, legal fees can, can start really around $1,000 and, and go up from there. A lot of folks have difficulties with English. Um, they may have not quite the level required to pass the interview. Um, a lot of areas of the state really don't have um, a lot of legal assistance available, especially affordable legal assistance. We see huge turnouts at our, at our events in central and eastern Washington for that reason. The process can be really daunting um, and really complicated, and so a lot of people are fearful, um, fearful of immigration processes in general, and are just afraid and, and feel that it's risky to apply. Some of the responsibilities of volunteers at Citizenship Day, broadly speaking, are um, number one, to recognize and remember that every person who comes through our door is a real client who has a complicated story and we want to be very careful um, with them and kind to them. The paralegal is the first person who actually fills out the form and establishes kind of uh, foundational trust with the client, and so it's, um, it's very important to be very cour courteous and patient and really create a space where, where the client can open up to you. We want to make sure that we go through every single question on the form, Ask those questions in different ways if, um, if the client seems like they maybe don't understand. 
Never make assumptions about someone's answers and, and don't skip around. One of the things that we also try to do is work with the client alone. We have a one client to one paralegal or one client to one attorney rather than having you know husbands and wives together or family members around because there may be things that the client doesn't want to share in front of their family or friends that are really important to their application. And the only way that we can give them good legal advice and, and help them fill out their application is if they fully disclose everything that the application asks for um, and that they feel comfortable doing so. Finally, um, trust your instincts. If something is coming to your attention that you are not sure of but you think it might not quite be right, um, we have plenty of attorneys who are there for every stage of the process and you can flag those things raise your hand and ask someone if you're in, an, in doubt at any point. So I'm going to go through pretty quickly the um, basic eligibility requirements to naturalize. The applicant must be at least 18 years old to file for naturalization. Um, there are certain residency requirements associated with the application, which means that your, your main home and your, and your residence must be in the U.S. Um, and that's a little different from the physical presence requirements, which mean um, whether you were outside the U.S. on a trip abroad or inside, where was your physical person, were, they, were you inside the U.S. or not, um, and for how long. All applicants are required to have good moral character, which is a more complicated concept than it sounds, and we'll, we'll go through that very, very briefly. Um, applicants must be able to speak, read, and write basic English. They must have a basic knowledge of U.S. history and civics and be willing to take the oath of allegiance to the United States. Everyone has to be over 18 to self-file for naturalization. However, children who are under 18 automatically become citizens when at least one of their parents naturalizes. So we see a lot of applicants at Citizenship Day who have children and any child under 18 um, would automatically become a citizen, no application necessary when that parent um, passes the interview and takes the, the oath of allegiance to the U.S. The requirements are that the child must be residing in physical and legal custody of their U.S. citizen parent, and the child must be a lawful permanent resident or a green card holder. So that's a good thing to know, especially if you're working with um, clients who have children, um, just to remind them that as soon as they naturalize, their, their kids under 18 um, who are in physical and legal custody of them will become citizens when they do naturalize. So I'm going to go through the um, continuous residence requirements. Um, so legal permanent residents or lawful permanent residents or green card holders, same thing, are eligible to apply for naturalization once they've completed five years of legal permanent residency in the U.S. Um, if they're married to U.S. citizen, they're allowed to apply under kind of a fast track rule, which means that they only need to be married to a U.S. citizen for um, three years and living in marital union at time of filing, which means they must be still together with their U.S. citizen spouse and be living in the same house as them. So um, the residence must be continuous. Um, trips abroad are allowed, absences are allowed, but they must be um, shorter than a certain amount of time in order to avoid breaking what's called continuity of residence. The applicant must reside in the um, CIS service district or the state where they file the N-400 for the last three months. This typically doesn't come up much at Citizenship Day, but if someone comes to you who, for whatever reason, moved to Washington from California a week ago, then they would not be eligible to, to file at this time. The applicant must reside in the U.S. from the time they file their application to the time they take the oath. Trips abroad are okay, but um, they can't actually move to another country before they, um, before they take the oath. And finally, um, USCIS permits an applicant to apply for citizenship three months before they fulfill that residence requirement, which is, again, three years if you're married to a U.S. citizen spouse, or five years um, from the time that you got your legal permanent resident card. So you can file either two years and nine months or four years and nine months at the time of filing. And the reasoning behind that is that once you file your application, it's always more than three months until you uh, 
have your interview and do the oath. Um, the Western Washington office is on a bit of a delay, and so those applications are taking um, six to seven months. This is just to give you an idea of what green cards can look like. These were all issued at different times um, or different eras, and they're not all green. In fact, most of them aren't. It's not your job to, you know, decode these much. You just want to be able to find the A number and the date that the client became a, a permanent resident. And so you can see that those are marked um, on various examples of green cards. The physical presence requirement is a little bit different from the residency requirement. This requires that all applicants have been physically present in the U.S. for at least half of the previous five years or half of the previous three years if they're filing um, based on their marriage to a U.S. citizen, um, which is under the three-year rule. Good moral character. Every application for naturalization is evaluated on whether this person has good moral character or not. Um, and it's a pretty complicated concept and not something that you need to know in depth for your paralegal role, but I say this only to um, make sure that you're aware that if anything like this happens to come up in your conversation with clients, you'll want to flag that for um, an attorney to look at because these can be um, potential bars to being able to establish good moral character. So if anyone's been convicted of an aggravated felony after November 29, 1990, and if they have any of the following issues within either the last three years or the last five years, depending on whether they're applying based on a U.S. citizen marriage or not. All of these issues can um, result in automatic denials to the naturalization application. As you can see, there's quite a variety of um, issues, and it's not all inclusive by any means. But when we talk about filling out the application, we'll go through this in, in, in more detail. But I just want to use this to, to serve as, as an example of how complicated naturalization law can be. Here are other bars that are not mandatory, but the adjudicating officer can use any one of these to deny the application. Um, if, if this is true for, for any of your clients, if they've had um, tax violations, if they've accidentally voted, if they have other criminal violations, which as you can imagine encompasses a whole um, range of, of crimes and other unlawful acts as they call them. Again, not for you to memorize or know, um, but to flag should any of this come up um, as, you're, as you're working with clients. All clients for citizenship do need to prove their ability to speak, read, and write English at a basic level. It's determined at the interview, and USCIS has said it's usually about a fourth grade level of English, um, but there are exceptions for certain people who, um, who do not have to speak English to, in, order, in order to naturalize. So if someone is at least 50 years old and has at least 20 years um, of legal permanent residency at the time they file, they don't need to speak English and they can take the US History and Civics exam in their own language. The same rule applies if you're 55 years old and have at least 15 years of legal permanent residency on the date of filing. Um, in short, we call this the 50-20 rule and the 55-15 rule. Um, again, not something that you need to inform clients of. The attorney should inform them of this as well, but if you're working with anyone um, who this might apply to, it might be good for them to know. Um, there's one other way to, to qualify for um, an exemption from the English requirement, and that is through the disability waiver. This is for people who um, have a medically determinable um, condition that makes it impossible for them to learn English. We do not complete these at Citizenship Day. This is the N-648 form. It has to be completed by a doctor. There's quite a strict standard. Um, we have a, a resource sheet that you can give to clients who express interest in the disability waiver, but again, it's, it's quite a strict standard. Um, old age is not a medically determinable condition, neither is illiteracy. It really has to be something um, like a traumatic brain injury or a stroke or dementia, um, medical conditions that make it impossible um, to learn English. So that's another possibility. But we refer those out. Um, the only exemptions that we cover at Citizenship Day are just these two that are based on age and residency, which are automatically given. 
Applicants must also demonstrate um, some basic knowledge of U.S. history and civics. Um, they'll be given a hundred questions to study between the time they file and, and their interview, which again can be several months out. And they need to answer six out of ten of these correctly in order to pass their interview. If someone is exempt from the English requirement under the 50-20 uh, rule or the 55-15 rule, uh, they'll take the U.S. History and Civics test in their own language. There's an additional exemption available for um, applicants who are at least 65 years old and have at least 20 years of residency as a legal permanent resident. They only have to study 20 questions, um, and they'll be given 10, and they have to answer 6 correctly. And that test, again, will be given in their own language. It is possible, again, to um, apply for the disability waiver in order to not um, have to take the U.S. History and Civics exam. But again, it's really difficult standard. We refer those out because um, they have to be completed by the applicant's uh, medical doctor. So in addition to the good moral character bars that we talked about before, which um, would definitely result in, in the denial of a citizenship application, um, there's quite a bit of overlap with certain offenses and um, other, other issues that would not just result in a denial of the application, but the, the applicant could get their green card revoked and they could be put in removal proceedings. So one of the most important things that we do at Citizenship Day is not just help people fill out the application, but also help people not apply um, when that could be a very risky thing for them. So we see people occasionally who um, come to Citizenship Day and have an issue um, described here that would put them at risk for removal. And so we try to give them as good legal advice as possible and refer them to, to private representation. Again, this is not for you to know, but just kind of background. Um, aggravated felonies, false claim to U.S. citizenship, um, giving false or misleading information to a government official. CIMT is a crime involving moral turpitude. Um, if that occurs within five years of admission or receiving the green card, that can be a major issue. Um, unlawful voting, and then finally obtaining one's green card um, through misrepresentation or fraud or other unlawful means. Um, and those are issues that the attorneys during the beginning of the day will screen for, but in case they, they happen to arise later in the day when a client is with you, these are definitely things to flag for the second round of attorneys because they can be very problematic. A completed N-400 application packet um, consists of the following, a complete and, and fully filled out N-400, two passport style photos, either a check or money order for the $680 filing fee or a fee waiver request, which we'll talk about later, um, a copy of both sides of the green card, and then occasionally clients have to submit uh, supporting documentation, and this could be court records, um, marriage and divorce certificates if the client's been married more than once. Um, all of those things will be compiled into an envelope and mailed to the USCIS facility in Phoenix. Electronic forms are accepted by USCIS in addition to printed forms. Um, at Citizenship Day, we do both. Um, we fill out forms uh, on electronically via PDF, and then we also do them by hand, depending on the site that you're at. Only black ink is accepted. Um, all caps is easier to read. And we're now going to talk about the N-400 form in detail. And we'll highlight particular sections going in chronological order that you'll want to pay attention to. So at this point, um, please have your N-400 form open and, and follow along with each section. So this is page one, part one. Um, and this addresses the uh, continuous residence requirements. At Citizenship Day, you will primarily always see um, number one and two. What, so if someone's qualifying under the five-year rule or under the three-year rule based on their marriage to a U.S. citizen. Um, if a client is eligible under Part 2, which means they've had their LPR card and they've been married to and living with a U.S. citizen for the last three years, um, it's preferable to apply under Number 2. And that's because the statutory period or the period during which they have to prove good moral character is shorter. It's only three years as opposed to five years. So if a client is eligible under both, better to do the three-year rule. Um, part two 
people need to put the name exactly as it appears on their green card, um, list other names that they have used, um, whether it's nicknames or maiden names or anything like that. Here, we will see in question four, it says if you'd like to change your name, um, print the name you'd like to use. That doesn't actually change their name. Um, they still have to request a legal name change. I don't really know why that's on the form, but it is not um, a legally binding name change. Question seven is the date that the person became a legal permanent resident. Um, and this should appear on their green card, so check out their green card to find that. Um, and confirm again their eligibility based on what you selected in part one, whether it was the three-year rule or the five-year rule. Question 10, um, or what we call the reasonable accommodations section. And this is for people who are blind or deaf or um, need a wheelchair accessible uh, place for their interview. These are what are called reasonable accommodations. It doesn't preclude the person from having to um, take the U.S. History and Civics test or be tested in English, but it provides reasonable accommodations. Um, it's not a special waiver and, and clients can request any of these things. Number 11 is the disability waiver, which we talked about earlier. Um, if a client expresses interest in, um, in applying for the disability waiver, then you can check yes here, but they would need to submit the N-648 completed by their doctor um, before they file this form. Number 12 are the exemptions um, to the English test based on the client's age and how long they've had their LPR status. If you select any one of these, USCIS will verify that the client does indeed qualify. If you for some reason miss one of these and don't select them, um, the client will automatically be able to take the, the test in, in their own language if they choose, if they meet the residency, I'm sorry, if they meet the the um, length of time as an LPR and the age requirements. Number three is the contact info area. USCIS always contacts clients through the regular mail, so you want to make sure that this is a valid and usable mailing address and a phone number. Um, the other contact information, like email, is optional. Part four is related to the continuous residence requirement. If the client doesn't have an address within the U.S. For the, for the last five years or if they are missing an address for an extended period, that's kind of a red flag for the attorney to ask about um, because if someone has six months where they never had a, an address, then that could be um, a sign that they were living outside the U.S. and maybe um, having some issues with the, with the continuous residence requirement. You want to start with the most recent address and then work backwards um, until you reach the, the five-year mark. And in case you run out of room, if someone has moved around a lot, we have pre-filled out addendums um, in the room that you can grab and they look exactly like this. And you can fill out the date and the address um, and attach that to the application. If the applicant doesn't know their full exact dates of residency, unfortunately these electronic forms don't accept incomplete dates. So as long as the client knows the month, um, the first of the month is fine to, to complete. But if they don't really know the month, if they say, you know, I know I moved there in the fall, but they don't know whether it was September, October, or November, you'll just want to leave the date blank on the computer. However, if you are filling out this form by hand, um, it may be acceptable to put spring or, or something else that's not the month, but generally if you're completing forms electronically, they only accept submissions in a certain format. And this is just a continuation of the residency page. So part five asks about the applicant's parents, um, and they want to know whether the person's mother or father um, was ever a U.S. citizen. And this is because every now and then at Citizenship Day, we find people who are already citizens and they just don't know it. And so if someone says yes to, to either of these questions, you really want to flag that for the attorney so we can determine if this person is already a citizen. USCIS, understandably, will not naturalize someone who's already a citizen. And so the next step for that person would be to get the appropriate documentation to prove their citizenship and, and get a passport rather than naturalize. Part six is um, information for USCIS to run a background check, which is done on all citizenship 
applicants. You can get this information from their driver's license. Um, unfortunately, there's no box for Hispanic or Latino, so clients can choose which box they want to check, but maybe white would be the best option um, according to USCIS guidelines. This is part seven. This section gets to all of the applicants' employers and schools that they've attended for the last five years. And an important thing to note here is that periods of unemployment have to be included as well because the entire five-year period or three-year, if they're applying under the three-year rule based on marriage to a citizen, that entire period needs to be covered. So even if they were only working for part of that time, you want to fill this in starting with the most recent job or time in school and work backwards. And if there's any time where the person was unemployed or self-employed, you want to put that in as well. There is a supplemental addendum if you run out of room. If someone has had a lot of times in school or, or a variety of different jobs, it looks exactly like this page. It will be um, at your station and you can fill that out and attach it to the form. And again, that additional sheet can be filled out by hand. So page seven, part eight, this section gets at both the continuous residence requirement and the physical presence requirement. Clients are required to list all trips that they've taken outside the U.S. during the last five years. And even though clients only need to fill out trips during the last five years, you want to ask them um, if they've ever been outside the U.S. for six months or more, even if it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and then flag that for the attorney. And when I say flag that for the attorney, I mean you'll have several um, sticky notes in front of you at your station, and you'll just want to be noting things that you think someone else should look at, and then you can stick those onto the printed application when, when you're done completing it, um, things for, for someone else to note. A trip longer than six months, any time, whether it's within the last five years or not, could be um, an issue in breaking the, the person's residence, so that's something that we'll want to look at. If a client has their passport, that's usually the easiest way to figure out how many total days, um, 24 hours or longer, the, the person has spent outside the U.S. during the last five years. You may want to work this out on a piece of scratch paper if they've taken a lot of trips before you fill out the form. And you'll fill out this little chart and, and the total days outside the U.S. for each trip. If someone's trips start to get close to 913 days outside the U.S., then that's kind of the danger zone. That would mean that's half of the last five years. So anything more than 913 days is a problem. If someone is applying under the three-year rule, they shouldn't be outside the U.S. for more than 547 days. And there will be calendars at your station going back several years that you can use to help clients figure out exactly how many days they've, they've been outside the U.S. It's very common for clients who are from Mexico or Central America to have traveled multiple times outside the U.S. and maybe it's not on their passport and so have them try to put together an estimate of all the trips they've taken and about how long each trip was and they can fill out a travel addendum and this is just a pre-made pre letter that says I cannot remember the exact dates of all my trips taken outside the US in the last five years however I know that I've only traveled to Mexico it was never more than 15 days at a time and I know that I was only outside the U.S. for about 100 days over the last five years. A statement like that is, is acceptable by USCIS. So figure out what is best with your, with your client. Some clients have taken one two-week trip outside the U.S. in the last five years. They know exactly the dates and they can fill this in and you're done. And other clients have more complicated travel histories. Um, so this section can take a little while to fill out. And again, you don't need to list any trips outside the last five years, but do ask if they've ever been outside the U.S. for more than six months and note that separately for the attorney. Part nine talks about the client's marital history, and they will need to list the legal name of their current spouse, um, other names that their spouse has used, the date of their spouse's birth, the date their marriage began, and their address. And this section is important for both both the clients who are applying under the, the five-year rule and those who are applying based on the, the three-year rule for those who are married to U.S. citizens. Now, if the client doesn't know 
the exact date that they entered into a marriage. It's okay to be approximate with that. And then the next section, part nine, um, starting with question six, uh, goes into the client's um, immigration status. If the spouse is not a U.S. citizen and doesn't have legal status, if they're undocumented, you'll check other, and then you can write either alien, which is unfortunately the term that um, USCIS prefers, or pending, if there is a pending petition on behalf of that person. If it's unknown, you can leave it blank. Number eight, the USCIS wants to know about your current spouse's previous marriage. Your spouses, your previous spouses, and... Um, your spouse's other spouses all need to be documented on the form. And this is mainly so USCIS can root out any possible marriage fraud. If there are multiple marriages or serial marriages in a short period of time, this is another thing to flag for the attorney because this can get at that good moral character issue of perhaps this person entered into a fraudulent marriage in order to obtain their green card. So if you see anything that kind of raises a red flag for you, if marriages are multiple and very short, that's one thing to, to note. There's another supplemental sheet in case you run out of space and you need to attach more marriages. If someone has been married more than once, they should bring their divorce certificate and, and marriage certificate to Citizenship Day, and so do use the dates from those documents. Part 10 talks about children, and they really want to know every single child. Every single child does need to be listed here. So that includes children who are living, missing, deceased, children born in the U.S. or outside the U.S., children under 18 years of age or older than 18 years of age, um, whether the, ch the child is currently married or unmarried, child living with you or elsewhere, stepchildren, adopted children, and children born um, when you are not married. There's only space for four children. If your client has more than four children, there is a supplemental sheet that you can attach to this um, form that you can fill out by hand and attach. The child's date of birth can be um, unknown if there's no way to get that information. And you'll want to fill out the total number of children here in part one. When we get to page 13, part 11, these questions will talk about the good mor moral character requirement for naturalization as well as um, root out any issues that could put the client in removal proceedings. So the answers to this section, it incorporates 53 questions, which we'll see shortly, could lead to, again, not only denial of the application for citizenship, but also beginning removal proceedings. Ask these questions slowly, um, ask them in different ways, and, and use great care to make sure the client understands what you're asking them and what the form is asking them. Try to provide examples wherever possible, and we suggest that you use this introduction before beginning this section because some of the questions are pretty awkward, um, and so it might be helpful to say something like this to let them know that this is not you being nosy about their personal life, but um, letting them know that you really do need to ask them all these questions and, and, and take each one of them one at a time. Part 11 begins um, a long series of questions that get at the issue of good moral character. And any time someone you're working with answers yes, you want to flag that for the attorney because this could be um, a, an eligibility issue. So the first three questions do deal with illegal voting, registering to vote or voting, claiming to be a U.S. citizen. Question number four is if the person has ever held a hereditary title of nobility in a foreign country. We haven't seen one of these yet at Citizenship Day. I'm hoping that one day we will. Um, but this person would have to renounce their... Um, title should they become a U.S. citizen. Question five, if there's a history of mental health issues that includes um, confinement, that's another thing to flag for the attorney. Questions um, six through eight deal with taxes. A lot of times at Citizenship Day we'll see people who have such low incomes that they are not actually legally required to file a tax return. Usually the filing threshold starts at about $10,000 or so in annual income for a single filer, and it goes up from there based on household size. We'll have a chart available where you can tell whether someone was required to file or not based on their income, but even if someone was not required to file, they still need to check yes on question 7, part A, because 
have you ever not filed a federal, state, or local tax return since you became a legal permanent resident? That answer is yes, but then they should fill out an addendum that we have pre-printed. It'll be at your station, and it's just a pre-written statement that says, I did not file in the years, you know, 2011 to 2012 because my income was below the legal filing threshold. And you'll just want to fill that out for the client when you mark yes to, to question 7 part A. Question 9, that gets at membership in organizations both positive and negative. So obviously red flags are anything related to terrorism or anarchy or violence or anything like that. But this is also a place where people can um, indicate membership in groups like churches or rotary clubs or other service organizations or sports teams even that show their, their ties and their commitment to their communities. The PTA is another good example. So ask people if they are a member of any groups like that and do indicate those on the space here because positive information in this section can also help them overcome other issues of good moral character that appear elsewhere in their, in their application. Question 10 deals with membership in the Communist Party. This is fairly uncommon at Citizenship Day. Sometimes you'll have people who are from a country for which membership in the Communist Party is, uh, is required or is mandatory. And so we have a, another pre-printed addendum where they can say that, that that's why they were a member of the, of the party. But again, any yes answer, you do want to flag for the attorney. If we get to the next section, these are additional questions that get at issues of good moral character. And questions 14 and 15, USCIS has determined that even if someone was a victim of genocide or torture, they still need to check yes because that, that means that they were involved, even if they weren't the, the perpetrators. It's not a problem for, for eligibility if they were a victim, but they do need to check yes and submit an, an explanatory statement because this section is worded so broadly. With question 15, sometimes people come from countries where um, military service is mandatory. And so for that question, they would check yes and again submit an explanatory statement saying that they, they were required to join the military. Page 15, part 11, you'll notice that some of these are questions that um, you don't want to just go down the line really quickly and check no to because a lot of them are if yes questions which means that if the original answer is no, you can leave the next two blank. So for example, number 17 and 18, if the person says no, I never sold, gave, or provided weapons to any person, then they don't need to answer A and B. Questions 22 through 28 deal with criminal um, convictions, arrests, citations. Um, it's very common for people to have to check yes to these. You'll see that question number 23 asks, have you ever been arrested, cited, or detained by law enforcement for any reason? So that means arrests where there were no charges brought, a citation is a traffic ticket, any citation that someone's ever gotten, even if it's one speeding ticket in their whole life, they do need to check yes and then give more information about that later on in the form. Criminal issues can really prevent someone from naturalizing and can possibly lead to removal proceedings, so do ask this question in multiple ways. Sometimes it's difficult for someone to understand, have you ever been detained by a law enforcement officer for any reason? So you want to ask it multiple ways, like have you ever gotten a ticket or have you ever talked to the police for any reason? Um, have you ever been, for, been to jail even just for a few hours? Even if someone's record has been expunged or if a conviction has been um, removed from their record because they've been perhaps in a deferred prosecution program or deferred adjudication program as mentioned in question 26, unfortunately that still counts for immigration purposes. And so you want to make it clear to people that you're talking to that they really do need to tell you everything. A lot of times people have maybe a minor criminal issue in their past that was wiped from their record after a period of good behavior and their defense attorney at the time said that, that it was not an issue that they needed to worry about in the future, but those things do count for purposes of immigration law. The next section asks for more detail on any arrests, citations, or, or charges that this person has, and if this section may come to you already filled out from the, the first attorney that saw the client, 
So typically, if, if a client discloses any criminal issues to their, their screener attorney at the beginning of the day, they will fill this out for you. But if you don't have this, feel free to leave it blank if you're unsure of how to, how to fill it out. Here's an example of how a, a speeding ticket is documented in this section, which is very common. Um, a lot of people have speeding tickets, and you just want to make sure that you uh, include the outcome of what happened with that. Question 30 deals with some additional good moral character type issues. And again, a lot of these questions can be very awkward to talk about with the client, so do um, try to maintain rapport with them. Give them a little disclaimer at the beginning like we talked about earlier and say, I have to ask you a series of questions. It's important that we go through each and every one of them and then proceed through the questions. Continuing on with part 11, questions 31 to 36. Those are any previous interactions with the immigration system. Again, any yes answer is a red flag for the attorney. We really want to know if someone has ever been deported or placed into deportation proceedings at any time. If they don't tell you or if they don't disclose it on the form, their fingerprints will certainly bring it up during their interview, and it's very important that all those issues get disclosed. Now questions 37 through 45 deal with military service. And we don't really see active military members at Citizenship Day, so this is not typically very common. Question 46 asks whether the applicant is a male who has lived in the U.S. Um, at any time between their 18th and 26th birthdays. And this is while they were a legal permanent resident. So if their legal permanent residency at all occurred between their 18 and 26 birthdays, they were supposed to have registered for the Selective Service. And a lot of people don't know about this, considering we don't have an active draft but it is a requirement. If you're with a client who is between 18 to 26 and they haven't registered, they can do so immediately by going to sss.gov and simply putting in their, their name and birth date. They can register that way and you can put the date on the form as that day's date and, and the selective service number that is generated. If the client is older than 31 years old and didn't register, that's not a problem. And that is because the statutory period that we're dealing with, remember, is the previous five years. So they were supposed to have registered between 18 and 26. And that they didn't is a problem, but because it's more than five years ago, because the person is at least 31 now, it's not typically an issue. We have a pre-made statement that will be at your station and the client can sign it that says, I did not know that it was required for me to register for the Selective Service. If I had known, I would have done so, and, and my failure to do so was not willful. And all they need to do is sign that and include that with the application. However, you'll notice there's a gap between people who are between the ages of 27 and 31 because they're too old to register for the Selective Service, but their failure to register was within the, the statutory period or that five-year window. So if you're dealing with any male applicants who are 27, 28, 29, 30, or up to age 31, then they will need to do one extra step. And it's a good idea to just flag this for the attorney. The client would need to request a status information letter, which is just confirming from the selective service that they are not registered. The attorney can help the client fill out the request form so you just need to flag this for them, you don't need to do it with them. And if the client requests it now, it will definitely arrive to, to him before the interview and then he should bring that to the interview. He also needs to submit the statement that says, you know, I didn't register for the selective service, but it was not willful. And you'll see these pre-made statements at your, at your station. Questions 47 to 53 go through the um, Oath of Allegiance to the U.S. You'll provide the client with a copy of the oath. We have them in English and Spanish and other languages at, at the station. But you'll want to read um, each line of the oath, uh, which corresponds to each question here, and have them reply yes or no. If someone's religion um, prevents them from taking an oath saying that they will bear arms on behalf of the U.S., then they can request a modified version of the oath at their interview. Question 53 you'll want to leave blank unless you have someone who has a, a title of nobility in their country, but that is probably not going to be the case. So at this point, you are totally done with your section of the form. 
don't have the client sign the form. It's very important that they, um, that they don't sign it until this form is reviewed by the attorney. The next page is the preparer's statement. The person who prepared this form, if other than the applicant, needs to fill this out and sign it. You should not sign this. The quality review attorney, who is going to see this completed form and review it when you're done, is going to fill this section out. So please leave this part blank. I want to talk briefly about working with an interpreter. So if you don't happen to speak the language that your client speaks, we will assign you an interpreter. Wherever possible, we do try to match up. If we have a Mandarin-speaking client, we try to match them up with a Mandarin-speaking paralegal or a Spanish-speaking paralegal for a Spanish-speaking client. But every now and then, we don't have this capability, and so we have um, interpreters who are on site. So before you get started, you'll want to talk through the procedure with your interpreter and your client. Make sure that everybody knows that everything discussed um, is confidential ask the interpreter to do word-for-word -word translation. They should not summarize what the person said or paraphrase. They should really do it word-for-word. -word. Remind your client to speak slowly and pause often to allow for interpretation. And you need to do the same. Try not to say more than one sentence at a time without letting your um, interpreter interpret. And then finally, something to remember. Look at the client when you're speaking, not at the interpreter. It is the client who, who's talking and the interpreter should be, should be kind of off to the side. Interpreting is really hard work. It's very taxing on the, on the brain, so make sure to give the interpreter breaks when he or she needs. Another thing to note, at your stations or in the resource box at the front of the room, there will be versions of the N-400 application in Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Spanish. The interpreter should not have to interpret the form in English in their head and then say it to the client. They should have a, an already translated form um, in front of them. It makes the process a lot easier. So if you see that your interpreter doesn't have the version of the N-400 in front of them in their own language, please make sure to, to get them one. Page um, 19 and 20, part 14, is for applicants who used an interpreter to complete the form. However, do note in the language here that this statement should only be filled out if this client is going to request an English ex exemption and use an interpreter. So for example, let's say someone has basic English. Um, they don't qualify for the English waiver um, because they don't have enough years as a legal permanent resident or they're not old enough and they speak basic enough English to pass the interview but they prefer to do the form with an interpreter just to make sure that all of their answers are clear and that they fully understand each and every question. In that case you would not fill out the interpreter statement because the client has to be requesting the waiver for English and have used an interpreter to fill out the form. And so this section if applicable you'll have the client sign and then the interpreter will sign and fill this out as well. So after you complete the um, N-400 application for citizenship, you can ask the client if they know about the um, 680 filing fee and if they want to see if they qualify for a fee waiver. They may bring this up to you themselves. You want to make sure the client has um, proof of income or proof of receiving public benefits with them. We cannot do a fee waiver application if they don't have this proof with them. So they need to either have things like pay stubs or last year's tax return or a letter from DSHS describing that they get food stamps or another benefit. If you have done fee waivers before or if you feel comfortable filling one out, you can continue with your client and do the fee waiver application with them. Or you can send the client um, back to the flow manager who's the person in charge that day and they can go to um, an experienced paralegal to fill out the fee waiver form. There are three ways to qualify for the fee waiver. Um, the fee waiver enables someone to apply for citizenship without paying the $680 fee at all and it's for low-income applicants. And So there's three ways to qualify. Um, there's Part A, which means the household receives a means-tested benefit. And that means that another government organization has um, made an evaluation of their income and decided that they um, can receive a benefit like food stamps or TANF, which is temporary cash assistance for needy families, or Medicaid or um, SSI is another one. So 
Someone has to qualify using only one of these three ways. The second way to qualify is if the household income is less than 150% of the federal poverty line. And the household income includes all um, adults who live in the house. It's based on the income reported on their tax return from last year. And um, it can also be substantiated with a letter from their employer that describes their income or um, pay stubs that cover um, several months of the year. Part C um, is another way to qualify for the fee waiver. The household has to show an extremely unusual and difficult financial hardship. We don't do these at Citizenship Day because they take a very long time to fill out. They almost never get approved. You really have to um, have an extremely compelling and unusual case. So if someone does not qualify under Part A and B, and they, their only option is to do Part C, you want to refer them out to a partner who can do that. Um, we have a screening worksheet available that you can talk through with the client to, to confirm their eligibility step by step. And again, the client must have either proof of income or proof of public benefits with them um, at Citizenship Day. So if you have your um, I-912 application for the fee waiver with you, uh, please do open that PDF so you can see what sections correspond to which. If the client is eligible under Part A, which means they receive, let's say, food stamps, that is the absolute easiest way to fill out this form. You'll fill out Sections 1 through 3, Section 4, and Section 7. Don't fill out anything else. And you'll attach their benefits letter. A benefits letter from DSHS should have the person's name, it should have the amount of the benefit, and it should be relatively recent. Um, ideally, it's, it's dated within the last three months because the person has to be currently receiving benefits in order to qualify. If someone has low income and receives benefits, it's always, always best to apply under Part A, because it's quite a bit easier to fill out the form. But let's say someone does not receive public benefits, but their household income is less than 150% of the poverty line. You can um, apply under Part B. So you'll fill out Sections 1 through 3, Section 5, and Section 7 only, don't fill out anything else. There will be um, poverty guidelines at your station so you can determine um, what's the cutoff for each household size. And that uh, was also emailed to you, so that should be one of the attachments that you have access to. The income guidelines are, are quite low, um, so a lot of people think that they may qualify based on their income when it turns out that they make um, too much money for, for the fee waiver, unfortunately. On the um, intake form, which we'll go over in more detail in a, in a second, you'll want to mark that you did the, the fee waiver application for the client. And if you feel unsure about filling out a fee waiver application for someone, if you haven't done it before, a good rule of thumb is that if the person receives public benefits, like food stamps are an easy one, um, it's pretty easy to go ahead and fill out the, the fee waiver for them. But if someone wants to qualify based on their income, it might be better to pass that along to um, an experienced paralegal who has done fee waivers before. There may be clients who don't qualify for the fee waiver, um, and another option for them is they can take out a citizenship loan. And these are only available in certain areas of the state, but depending on where your Citizenship Day site is located, we'll have flyers and brochures available for the credit unions that do citizenship loans in their area. Make sure to tell clients about them if they are interested. There's also going to be a video playing that talks about different ways that people can afford the citizenship process, whether it be through fee waiver or the loans or um, just regular banking and, and budgeting tips. Okay, now we're going to go through a little bit of what to expect on Citizenship Day and, and how you can um, be prepared for the flow of the day. We ask that um, paralegals arrive no later than um, 8.30. It's best to plan for an 8 a.m. arrival to make sure you get time for coffee and breakfast and we can start the, the orientation to your stations. At 10 a.m., um, the doors are going to be open to clients. Often clients will get there between two and three hours early to get in line. They know that this is a very um, high demand day. We'll give them an intake form to start filling out as soon as they get there. We close the doors at 3 p.m., but um, do expect to stay until around 5 o'clock when we finish the last round of clients. At 
10 a.m., attorneys will start screening the first round of clients. And as soon as each of those clients gets done with screening, they'll move on to you, the paralegals. And so you'll start taking clients immediately after the screening, which is anywhere from maybe 20 minutes to an hour, just depending on how, how quickly the, the screenings move along and how complicated the person's case is. So we really appreciate your flexibility. Um, because these events are first come, first serve, they're usually high turnout, but we don't take appointments, um, so the volume of clients can ebb and flow. So we appreciate your flexibility quite a lot. Okay, the way that we run citizenship days are there are six basic stations that clients should pass through in order to successfully complete the day. And in between each of those stations, they see a flow manager. And the flow manager is usually a designated person from One America whose job it is to keep track of where each client is in the process and make sure we don't lose track of anybody. So as someone is moving from the intake station to the attorney screening, to the paralegal station, to quality review, they need to check in with the flow manager at each point just to make sure that they are on track and we, um, we know where everybody is. It gets more important as the end of the day approaches because there, there will be a line of people for certain stations and so we want to make sure that we know exactly how long everyone's been waiting, what the order is, so we can call clients in the order that they started waiting. We're going to go through the stations in detail now. And the first station is the intake desk. So when a client first shows up at Citizenship Day, they'll check in at the front desk, and the intake volunteers will do a very basic check just to make sure that the client is indeed there to apply for citizenship and that they have, at minimum, their green card with them. If they have any other um, issues, like criminal issues or anything else that they would need supporting documentation for, the attorney who's screening them will make that determination, but the, at the intake station we just want to make sure that they're there and they're basically prepared to, to try to apply that day. The intake volunteer is going to give the client a yellow and blue intake form to start filling out. Once the client is done filling out their intake form and there's an attorney available, we're going to call their name, get them sit, sat down with an attorney or a BIA accredited rep, um, to go over their fully completed intake form. And this is where we can see kind of basic biographical data, um, info on their marriages, their children, the addresses that they've lived at, the trips they've taken outside the U.S., and any criminal issues. The attorney is going to review and sign um, limited legal advice agreement with the client and go through their intake form. If you look in the attachments, you'll see a PDF called CD Intake and Screening Form. And this will be printed on yellow and blue paper, so it will be pretty recognizable during the day. The first page is filled out um, actually by the attorney. And so the attorney is going to go through each of these eligibility screening questions and talk with the client. And any time they get a yes answer, um, they'll, they're going to dig a little deeper on that and um, get more information to see if there are any eligibility issues. And so if it seems risky for a client to apply without representation, or if a client should not apply at all because they have potential deportation, removability issues, we always refer them out. Citizenship Day is meant to enable clients to file pro se or file on their own without representation. So we want to give them good advice, help them fill out the form correctly, and apply on their own. But we don't want to put anyone forward who would need representation at their interview. Um, we don't want to put anyone at risk like that. If the attorney finds that there are some minor criminal issues that won't cause the client problems, they may choose to pre-fill out page 15 and 16 of the N-400, which is that little criminal chart, um, just to make things easier on the paralegals in terms of knowing how to fill that out. So they may do that. The attorney will also um, review the client's green card and the supporting documentation that they brought, just to verify that they have all of the documents that they might need to proceed that day. So if the attorney clears the applicant and says, you're good to go, you can fill out your, your N-400 now, they will move on to you. And the forms completion station, uh, number three, is where all of the paralegals will be located. And so you'll want to start by taking a look through the client's yellow and blue intake form. Note any issues that the attorney has flagged for you. 
and um, you'll get started filling out the N-400. If you're in doubt at any point about filling out any part, it's perfectly fine to leave it blank um, and flag it for the next attorney who will review the completed form or the QR attorney. If the client needs help with a fee waiver afterward, again you can fill out their fee waiver form after you finish their N-400 or you can pass them along to a, an available paralegal there who can fill out their form. When you're done, um, if you're completing forms electronically, and we're doing this more and more, you'll print the completed application, um, make sure to save it often, and um, on the printed form you'll add some sticky notes to any sections that you left blank or you're not sure about, or if you think there might be an issue, you'll just add sticky notes and make appropriate notes so that the next attorney who reviews the form knows what to look for. Then you will flag down um, a designated runner volunteer or the flow manager in your room to um, let them know that the client is ready for quality review and to get them in line. And our goal is that the quality review attorney should be able to read um, a printed application and be able to access the electronic version either via USB, a drive, or Dropbox so they can make changes if they need to make changes. Again, this only applies to, to places where we fill out the forms electronically. If you're filling out a form by hand, then you'll just give the quality review attorney um, the hand completed form. Finally, before you leave, do fill out the um, intake checklist. So on that yellow and blue intake form, this is the only record that One America has for the client's participation in the day. So we just want to know um, where everyone went through the process and, and who did what. And so that section is on page two, looks like this. And you'll want to check off that you completed the N-400, you noted any red flags for the quality review attorney, um, you gave the client a copy of the oath, and if they needed assistance with the fee waiver, you can check yes and either put your name um, in the next in the fee waiver box or you can check yes and leave that fee waiver box blank and then the paralegal who does their fee waiver will fill that out. But this is just a checklist so we know exactly what was done on this client's case at Citizenship Day. Station 4 um, is the quality review station and this is where um, our more senior and experienced immigration attorneys will be and they will review the client's fully completed N-400 and the I-912 application for a fee waiver and they're going to check to see if there are any issues that could have been missed, any sections that are filled out incorrectly, um, any blank sections that you were unsure about that they need to fill in um, to make sure that this application is ready to go. They'll take another um, review of the client's green card, supporting documentation, and then the quality review attorney is actually going to sign that prepares signature statement um, and indicate their name and their firm name and, and their contact info. Every client who successfully completes a, um, an application at Citizenship Day will be sent home with a, a blue folder that's called What to Do Next, and that'll make sure that they're prepared um, for what happens after they submit their form. So when they'll be contacted about a fingerprinting appointment, when they can expect their interview, um, how to update their address with USCIS, etc. So if the quality review attorney says that this client is good to go, their form is um, complete and they are okay to file, then they will grab a runner and the runner will escort the client to the copy station, which is station five. At the copy station, the client will get a full copy made of their N-400 and all their supporting documentation. We'll copy both sides of their green card, their um, I-912, their benefits letter, all of that. And then the volunteer will package the application um, so it's ready for the client to send by certified mail. Every client should leave with um, the fully packaged application that's ready to go and then a um, full copy that they can keep and study for their interview. Station 6 is the exit station and this is just kind of our, our close out wrap up station. We ask clients if we can take their picture um, so we can promote this event in social media and other applications for funding. We have a ton of helpful resources. Um, we have information on know your rights and flashcards to study for the U.S. History and Civics exams, 
ESL classes in their area, citizenship classes in their area, the nearest post office for them to mail their form. We have quite a few documents, so do encourage clients to um, spend a little time at the exit station to, to see if there's anything there that they could use. We talked a little bit about completing forms electronically. Most sites do complete um, the N-400 on a computer. But generally, um, if you are at a, an electronic site, the blank N-400 will be pre-saved on the desktop of your laptop or your computer that you're working on. You want to make sure to fill out the N-400 in Adobe Reader. You don't want to open it in an internet browser or in preview mode in Dropbox. You want to make sure you're actually in the Adobe Reader program or your changes will not be saved. Please do save often and save in the format uh, client last name and first name and you can save it to the desktop of your computer um, until you're ready to save it to USB drive if you like but do save often and, and I would check after you filled out the first page um, close the form and reopen to make sure that your changes are being captured. Adobe Reader can sometimes um, be a little finicky or tricky and so if, especially if you're not comfortable with that program do close and reopen early to make sure that your changes are being saved. Um, when you're done, you'll want to save the completed form to either a USB drive or to Dropbox, depending on the site that you are at. Um, it'll be one or the other, as the client's last name and first name. Um, and again, we'll go over this at each orientation. Um, when you arrive, another reason it's important to arrive early, because we'll go over uh, the electronic procedure. And there will also be one or two tech savvy volunteers in the room with you who can help if you um, are having trouble with Dropbox or you're not sure um, about anything with the USB, they can, they can help troubleshoot with that. Number one rule of Citizenship Day is to be flexible and so just in case there are any tech issues of any kind, we'll have paper forms and pens, plenty of them at the site um, so that we can fill out these forms. And the flow manager at your site will make that call as soon as possible, if necessary, if there are any issues, because we don't want to waste too much time trying to work out networking, printing situation, if, if at all possible. So a few last notes to be aware of. Um, please take the time to read through the station instructions before Citizenship Day. That's a two-page document, again, attached to this email, which goes step by step through everything that we just talked about. We know that it's a lot of information and we really appreciate you taking the time to come to Citizenship Day prepared and being, being familiar with the instructions. These station instructions are also posted at each station, but sometimes throughout the day it gets a little crazy and you don't have time to, to read through them, but um, do try to read through those at least once before coming. And then finally, watch your email. Um, we'll send out a couple important updates as the date gets closer. Nothing will change dramatically, but um, do keep an eye on your email for important updates. That is it. And thank you so much for taking the time to view this presentation. And um, what you're doing on Citizenship Day really makes a huge difference in the lives of a lot of people. This is just one of several thousand people who have been able to naturalize thanks to this program. If you have any questions about any of the content, please send us an email and we're happy to try to answer those before the date. And then at your site, you'll want to talk to um, the flow manager if you have questions the day of. Okay, thank you so much.